Hi everyone, welcome to day two of Elasticon. I hope you enjoyed day one. It was great to hear from Shai, our CEO, and Ash, our Chief Product Officer, talking about where we're focusing at the high level. Uh, but today we'll be diving deeper into the products, the use cases, and hearing stories from our customers and users. And to kick things off, we wanted to dive into the Elastic Stack, Elasticsearch and Kibana, which are at the core of everything we do. Uh, and I'd like to start by handing it over to Ori Cohen, Senior Director of Product Management, to talk about why we think about building these products as a platform, how it helps us build faster and better products, and how that impacts the way you use and operate the Elastic Stack. Over to you, Ori. Thanks so much, Steve. Hope everyone had a great first day at the conference and that you're excited as I am about today. My name is Uri, and I lead the product team for Elastic Cloud. We have some awesome content and demos lined up for you today. But let's first dive into the Elasticsearch platform and the tremendous benefits it brings to our users. One key thing that sets us apart from all other products and competitors is that everything we build on is built on top of one platform, at the core of which lies Elasticsearch, a single data stores that stores and give you rich search-based access to all of your data, regardless of the use case. This has tremendous benefits to our users, from application developers through security analysts to SREs and operation engineers. It means you can easily correlate and visualize data types from multiple sources by relying on a common data schema. For example, jump from error logs of your Kubernetes pods right into the performance metrics of the underlying containers and servers, and from there to APN traces of the service running within those containers, all within the same UI, leveraging the powerful search and analysis capabilities of Elasticsearch. It also means you can view the same data through different lenses. For example, your web server access logs, which you can use to troubleshoot the health of your web server, also to identify login attacks on that service. But having a single platform is also critical from an operational perspective. There are just fewer components to manage, which makes your system drastically less complex to operate. It also matters to buyers and executives. Reducing tool scroll means spending less time and money on tracing and swiveling between products. And that translates into more efficient workforce. It also means there are fewer contracts to negotiate. I can't think of anyone who looks forward to having to negotiate with five different vendors just to purchase the critical tools to run their business. And while we always support it and will continue to support our customers who prefer to manage the Elastic Stack on their own, we believe that the best way to experience the Elastic Search platform is through our managed service, Elastic Cloud. Let's see why. First, a primary goal for us is to be where our users are, both in terms of cloud providers and geographical regions. Data has gravity, and by being present in many regions, we allow our users to bring their data closer to their applications for increased performance and reduced data transfer costs. We therefore invested quite heavily in our regional presence and have deployed Elastic Cloud in 45 regions across the three major cloud providers. Elastic Cloud customers can deploy in all of these regions and providers from a single account and diversify their cloud investments as opposed to depending on a single infrastructure provider. In addition, customers can implement disaster recovery policies across these providers right from within Elastic Cloud, further increasing the resiliency of their applications and services. This is not a theoretical concern. Many customers we've run into in the last few years have had multi-cloud strategy. But it's also about being where our users are in their journey towards moving their businesses to the cloud. We need to make sure Elastic Cloud meets your most demanding requirements and expectation when entrusting your most valuable data to us. Certifying Elastic Cloud and key compliance programs like SOC 2, FedRAMP, HIPAA, and others means that you know that we hold ourselves to the highest standards in your industry and give you the utmost confidence and peace of mind. When you choose our managed Elasticsearch offering, we do all the heavy lifting for you. First, creating a deployment on Elastic Cloud is a matter of minutes. We chose the right hardware for every use case and implemented architectural best practices right into it. Elastic versions are also always available on Elastic Cloud the day they are released, and you can upgrade to them with just a few clicks and zero downtime. We also handle the maintenance and upkeep so you can focus on gaining insights that help your business. We do automated backups to the cloud provider's bulk storage, OS patching and hardening at a regular cadence, encryption of data in transit and at rest, and rich network security controls to ensure that your data is safe wherever it may be. 
Subscribing is also super easy. Once you've completed a free trial, you can easily sign up and choose the product tier that suits your needs. And you can change this choice at any time in the future. We'll only charge you for what you actually used. If you already have a cloud account with Azure, Google, or, or AWS, you can also subscribe through their respective marketplaces and get billed via your account in these cloud providers. Now, before we dive into the awesome Elastic Stack features and demos in this session, I did want to take a moment to cover a few features that are unique to Elastic Cloud. Having the same engineering team who created the Elastic Stack also build Elastic Cloud allows us to vertically integrate our cloud platform with Elasticsearch and Kibana in a way that no one else can and bring compelling functionality to our users. Let's dive into those features. First, auto scaling. Auto scaling of Elasticsearch is unique functionality only available on Elastic Cloud. When you enable it with a single click, Elasticsearch data nodes will be scaled based on storage utilization. So your cluster never runs out of storage. Elasticsearch will continuously evaluate the required storage based on how fast your storage utilization grows and will signal to Elastic Cloud that it needs more capacity to accommodate for the growing volume of data. Elastic Cloud will pick up that signal and add the required capacity to the cluster without any noticeable impact to your application. In the coming months, we'll be enabling auto scaling by default for all new deployments and save our users a lot of hassle of sizing and operating their clusters. We plan to add additional auto scaling dimensions like data ingestion rate and search throughput, as well as support auto scaling for Kibana and other stack components. Our ultimate goal here is to provide a simple turnkey experience to our users and make operating your deployments a no brainer. Next, let's talk about data tiers. Data tiers are all about making the cost and performance trade-offs that are right for your specific use case. Elasticsearch supports four distinct tiers, hot, warm, cold, and frozen. The hot tier is for data you want to access the fastest. And as you move through the tiers from hot to cold to warm to frozen, you trade off query and ingestion performance for reduced cost. The first benefit of using Elastic Cloud in this context is that we made the harder choices for you. Our engineers spent literally months to figure out the right instance types for each tier in each cloud provider, so you get the most optimal configuration right out of the box. Moving data between the tiers is done with the data retention features in the Elastic Stack and specifically index lifecycle management. Index lifecycle management will also be integrated into our hundreds of available data source integrations, so ILM policies will be configured automatically for you. Now, the neat thing is that when auto scaling is enabled for your deployment, Elastic Cloud will automatically pick up the signal from Elasticsearch that a warm, cold, or frozen data node is needed to host your data and will automatically create them for you so you don't have to lift a finger to read the benefits of data tiers. I mentioned earlier that Elastic Cloud is available across three cloud providers in 45 regions. Now imagine a global deployment that replicates data between multiple regions and cloud providers or allows you to search across all of them in a single search request. You can do just that with cross-cluster replication and search. Cross-cluster replication allows you to place replicas of your data in other regions. This improves reliability and lowers latency because users can search the data in the location closest to them and your applications can still access the data even if a complete region or even a cloud provider fails. Similarly, cross-cluster search breaks down geographically disparate data silos by giving you the ability to search across multiple clusters even if they reside in different cloud providers and regions. Elastic Cloud takes care of all the underlying heavy lifting of configuring the replication path and establishing trust between the involved clusters. Lastly, I wanna talk about cloud native data ingestion. Our aim is to make data ingestion into the Elastic Cloud ridiculously easy. As you've heard in yesterday's keynote, and we'll see later in this session, we've worked very hard to simplify the data, the data onboarding process with features like unified Elastic Agent and integrations repository. But chances are most of our users leverage cloud native data sources, such as AWS Kinesis, GCP PubSub, and Azure Event Hubs, and many others. So beyond the Elastic Agent, we've recently announced a number of native integrations with Azure and GCP. Specifically, we added the ability to send Azure activity and resource logs to your Elastic Cloud deployment right from within the Azure portal. And similarly, send GCP PubSub events and BigQuery data by pointing your Elastic Cloud cluster right from within the GCP console. Expect more to come on this front around AWS Kinesis Firehose and other data sources in the future. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Mukesh. 
Mukesh will cover the significant improvements we've made to simplify the data onboarding process into the Elastic Stack. Over to you, Mukesh. Thank you, Uri, so much for the introduction. Um, hi, folks. I'm Mukesh. I am the Director of Product Management uh, responsible for all things injection at Elastic. Um, and I am really excited to walk you through the amazing improvements that we have made over the past, I would say, 18 months uh, to simplify the data onboarding into Elastic. So there are three main pillars for the radical improvements that we have made uh, and we shipped you know, a couple of releases ago. Uh, it starts with Elastic Agent. Folks you know, familiar with Beats, we had a Beat per use case, and now there's just one agent. You know that's unified for all type of use cases that you know elastic supports followed by a one-click integration a ui based uh, configuration management approach on what type of software you're trying to observe or protect and lastly uh, and probably the most important part is the remote and central agent management uh, of fleet of agents and that really is aimed at simplifying the uh, the day to operations of uh, you know the host of agents you have as well as sending them remote actions now let's look at uh, each of the pillar in detail so with beats you know as i said before if you take an example of nginx uh, in order to observe the nginx you would deploy file beat to collect the locks you would deploy metric beat to monitor and collect the metrics you would deploy heartbeat to uh, ping the Nginx server and see if it's up. You deploy you know, uh, the endpoint security if you want to protect any malware uh, you know, being uh, spread on the Nginx server. And if it's running on Windows server, then in order to collect the Windows operating system logs and metrics, you would deploy um, you know, WinLog beats. So really five different beats and you're responsible for managing the operations of five different uh, you know, binaries. And, and that's what we changed with Elastic Agent. Now you have just one Elastic Agent for all the use cases, one thing to install, configure, manage, scale, and secure. Uh, the one-click integration. So let me tell you a little bit about integration. So what is integration? Integration is actually a collection of uh, assets that are required for successful execution of the use case that you are you know, trying to go after. So that contains all the configuration options that the agent should know uh, for protecting or observing your software, the elastic search assets, so that when agent sends the data, uh, the data is correctly stored, transformed in elastic search, and then analytics assets for Kibana, such as dashboards and uh, ML jobs and you know, rules in future, so that you get the analytics right out of the box. That's the one-click integration. Um, and, and the beautiful part about this compared to, you know, the Beats modules is it's all done through UI. Uh, there's obviously API uh, for infrastructure as a, you know, code use cases and a GitOps use cases, but, you know, for initial boarding, uh, onboarding, it's all through UI. The last and uh, the most important piece, as I mentioned earlier, is the central agent management of fleet of agents with the fleet uh, application. And, and that really enables you to have a quick visibility into host of agents, uh, you know, on your fleet of agents, uh, manage their day to life cycle, like their binary versions, what configurations they're running on, uh, et cetera, you know, and, and being able to update all of your agents with a click of button, uh, generating and uh, managing the credentials for each agent as they talk to Elasticsearch uh, you know, uh, through uh, uh, the auto generation of Elastic API keys, and and really at the heart of it, we're trying to simplify, like I said, the day two operations, so that you don't need to develop scripting to manage uh, the lifecycle of your agent and their policies. A really good example of uh, how easy it is through the central agent management and integrations to expand the use cases. Going back to the Nginx example, if the Nginx exa uh, if if you had an Nginx web server running that you were observing. Uh, collecting logs, metrics, you know, checking the uptime, and your security uh, team comes to you and say, "Hey, you know, we have a protocol. Every infrastructure software host needs to be, uh, you know, monitored with the endpoint security, so that you know we are not running malware on it." Really, the simple experience uh, with the uh, agent and fleet is, you, uh, you know, you enable the endpoint security integration on the Nginx agent policies in the UI, and boom, that's it.
nothing else. Like you don't need to go to host. You don't need to, you know, uh, change any files. It's all done via, you know, UI. All right. So we, uh, you know, that was a, a pretty uh, brief tour of uh, the amazing improvements that we have made so far. Let's see them in action. I have a um, Elastic Stack deployment on Elastic Cloud, um, and I'm on the screen of, uh, you know, adding data. Uh, the, the way I'm going to approach it is, you know, a dev team who has come to me as an Elastic Search platform administrator. Hey, I have this data source. I want to, uh, you know, analyze it in Elastic. Um, here's a sample file. Can you ingest? And uh, you know we can play around that in Kibana. So I have that file open, and behind the scene we are analyzing that. And uh, you know just to let you know what the file is as a state, a timestamp, IP address, uh, you know a key value pair, and then a message, right? And what we did here is uh, we actually try to automatically analyze it and understand, uh, you know, different fields that exist. So we understood there's a timestamp, we understood there's an IP address, and, and as you can see, that, that's been identified here. So one thing that we missed in this uh, automated analysis is like there's a state name, and you know, I don't see a state name here. It's really as easy as coming here and saying that I, I want to capture the data in the, you know, in the parentheses and I want to call it a state. And let's see if that actually changed it. Yes, so it did change, right? And it extracted all the states and it, it, there's a field called as state. Um, so this looks good. Let's actually go ahead and import it. So I'm going to give it an uh, index name and, and let's see what happens after this. So behind the scene, what's happening is these three steps, index, ingest pipeline, and index pattern is basically all the, uh, the plumbing that's needed for the Kibana analyst to start playing with this data. And uh, so as you can see, let's go to discover. And you'll see that the index pattern here and you see the data here and uh, you know the, the fields that we created all appear here, et cetera. So a really quick way of ingesting the data and letting your team, uh, you know, experiment with it. All right. So now that we have tested, you know, how this works by uploading a file, let's uh, let's understand how we're going to productionize this. So how are you going to actually ingest it from a host that's generating this file in a real time, in a streaming fashion? So for that, we're going to go to Fleet. And we are going to generate uh, or create an agent policy. We're going to call it custom logs ingestion. Just in custom logs. And we're going to tell it to collect system metrics, the operating system metrics on logs. And we're going to create that. And here we're just creating a template uh, agent policy uh, that just collects you know, the operating system logs and metrics, right? And our next step is we actually going to run this on our machine, right? So copy. And while that's happening, uh, what we could see is we'll see the agents, if the agent has detected that or not. So within seconds, you know, our system understood that, uh, you know, the agent has enrolled into the central agent management. And now it's actually updating the, the agent policy that we deployed and uh, you know it's taking actions on, on those regards right and so one thing to know is let's see if this goes healthy is uh, you know the data right? i mean the data started coming in we, we we told it to collect the operating system data it's it's flowing in within seconds that's great so now let's do what we wanted to do which is we want to add the custom logs integration All right so we come here And uh, what we give is a path name to the file. We give a data set as custom logs ingestion. And here is the bit on pipeline. So when we did the, uh, the file upload, you know, at the end of it, there were certain assets that got created. And then one of the asset was an ingest pipeline. 
And that's basically the transformation logic uh, that converts your raw data into the fields that, that we saw uh, that were automatically generated. So here we're going to reuse the pipeline that we you know, used. And we're going to say save integration and, and look what is happening. So the agent that is running on my machine, which is ingesting the operating system data, is now going to get an update to ingest data from this file. Right, so we're going to say save and deploy. And let's see now if uh, the files, the, the agent is actually ingesting data or not. So well, it takes, a, it takes you know, a few seconds to actually ingest that data. Let's actually see if the data, uh, if the uh, agent is actually detecting the file path or not. So we're gonna do custom logs. And yes, looks like it's actually detected uh, the custom logs, right? Uh, so it's definitely reading the file. So now actually go and check uh, whether the data is coming in or not. So for, uh, you know, so we have a data streams that are actually gonna check whether the data is getting ingested and boom, you start seeing the custom logs ingestion data coming in. So that's great. So we have validated that the, the agent is now not only ingesting the, uh, the operating system logs, but it's also ingesting the custom logs. So the next step is you go into uh, the stack management and what we are trying to do here is trying to create a, a Kibana view a Kibana you know, index pattern in which, which will point to the data that we created and then that will be the playground in which the Kibana users can modify the schema. And so yeah, I'm gonna create an index pattern with uh, logs, custom uh, logs ingestion, default, right? The next step, create an index pattern. And so that's done. So I'm gonna to go to discover and I'm gonna select the pattern that I just created. And I think the data was uh, at least a few days ago. So, you know, I have that and, and great, you know, I see the data, right? So now we just saw how easy it was with agent and fleet, uh, you know, tools to ingest this data in real time with streaming. Now let's actually, you know, the fast forward, the data is getting ingested and then the Kibana analyst, you know, start using it. And, and there's a use case uh, where, you know, uh, there's a field which has the, uh, you know, the, the website and that has a name field too. And they want to change that field to name to a domain and remove the double code. So basically they want to enrich the data and change the field name. Let's see how easy it is to do it in via Kibana, right? So I'm going to call it a domain and then I'm going to copy uh, a script that essentially does, uh, you know, essentially removes the uh, substring, uh, save. And let's see if the domain is added here. So let's add a domain, bingo. There you go. And then the one last slide that I have is, you know, really the future is where for the custom logs, we want to empower the analyst. We want to auto extract fields as much as possible in Kibana. And then we give them option to flip a switch to, to say, hey, here are some fields that I want fast because I'm using Elasticsearch. I want the performance to be fast. All right. That's all I had for the simplifying uh, onboarding uh, aspect. Back to you, Steve. Thanks, Mukesh. That's pretty exciting. As you can see, we've already come a long way towards simplifying the process of getting data into the Elastic Stack, and we're just getting started. That ability to bring in custom log sources and empower the data owners to enrich their own data on the fly with runtime fields is just amazing. Uh, and the ability to do that at query time with schema on read lets you iterate faster, but then flip a switch to begin indexing those fields going forward. It means you, you can have the best of both worlds, flexibility and speed. Now, getting data in and being able to query it is obviously a really important first step. 
Uh, but the real value comes from being able to understand that data and use it to make decisions, to protect your organization, to keep your infrastructure and applications humming. Uh, I'd like to hand it over to Alona Nadler, product lead for Kibana Analytics, to show us just how easy it should be to make use of your data. Hi, everyone. My name is Alona Nadler, and I'm the product lead for Kibana Analytics. Mukesh just showed you how we are making it easier to onboard and ingest new data. Once you already have data in Elasticsearch, how can we accelerate the insights? We want to enable you to get the right insights precisely when you need it. Now, especially with the types of data our users are using, it requires us to provide support for advanced analytics, for machine learning models, for time series analysis, and the speed of Elasticsearch together. Those or combined are what will allow us to accelerate insights and to empower you to perform complex and fact-based analytical decisions. Let me show you what we've been working on using an example. I'm using APM data, which stands for Application Performance Monitoring. It monitors my application and shows me what my users are experiencing and what's going on inside my application. And I see this metric, 24 seconds. A few questions come to mind. First, is it high or low? It seems to be high, but maybe it was always like that. How is it compared to yesterday? Is it going up or down? Is it normal? To answer some of those questions, I'm gonna jump into Kibana. Now, I'm in a dashboard in Kibana and I have my first panel here. Now, I want to see this panel over time. Let me clone it and I'm gonna expand it a little bit and jump to Lens to edit it. Now, Lens is our drag and drop intuitive UI to visualize data and do ad hoc explorations. Here on the bottom, Lens suggests a few ways to visualize this metric. One of them is over time. So I'm going to click on that. And I can see that immediately Lens showed me this metric over time. Now I'm going to change that to a line chart. And let's see what this metric is about. So this metric is looking at maximum of the transaction duration. Now I'm interested to understand what most of my users are experiencing. So I'm going to use percentile. I'm going to use 80% here. And when I look at this, it looks a little bit choppy and it seems to be elevating and increasing a little bit. Now, I'm interested in what happened previously in earlier times, whether it's previous hour or maybe previous day or week. To do that, we released in Lens something that's called time shifts. And I can select very easily what the time shift is. So in this example, I'm going to go to advanced options, click on time shift, and decide to look at it as the previous day. And I'm going to call it the label minus 1D. To give me some more space, I'm going to move the legend to the bottom. So just like that, I have one line that represents what's going on right now and the other one for the previous day. And I can see that right now is slightly more higher than the previous day. What comes to mind is something else. So in my company, we consider the long transactions if it's above 150K milliseconds. Now, this is a logic that is not in my original document. I can express that using runtime field. Runtime field is something new that we introduced a few months ago, and it allows you to create new fields on the fly, which are not in the original document. So I'm going to do that. Add a field to my index pattern, and I'm going to call it long transaction. And it's going to be a numerical value. And I'm just going to paste here a very simple script. If it's above 150 milliseconds, return one, otherwise return zero. And I'm going to save that. Now, what it does right now is just created right now a new field. And if I'll search for it for the index, I can see this field immediately. It looks like any other field. I can even click on it to get preview of the data. Now let's visualize it. So I'm going to drag that into the middle. And I'm going to change that to be some of long transactions. And to make it more distinguishable, I'm going to change that to be a um, stack. So what I see right now is the sum of my long transactions, which is interesting. I can see that there is like, in this point of time, 1,200. How is it in terms of the entire, the number of transactions, the overall number of transactions? Is it high or low? What's the ratio here? And, and I can also do that using formulas in Lens. In Lens, we took Excel spreadsheet formulas and we wanted to implement that in Lens so you'll have the ease of use of creating a formula 
and you can express your own logic, your own business logic and visualize it immediately. So I'm gonna go here and there is a tab that's called formula. And when I click on it, I even see that some of long transaction is what I have right now. And I'll do something in Lens, you can do all kinds of functions. You can see that here, you can see example, it's really helpful. What I'll do right now is quite simple. I'm just gonna divide it by all transactions. So count, and just like that, it becomes a ratio. I'm gonna format it as a percentage to make it more useful and call it long run transactions. Awesome. So in a few clicks, I'll just do one last thing and change the data bounds here. It should be between zero to one. So great, in the same chart, I can see what's going on in my transaction duration right now. How was it previous day? And also what's the ratio of long transaction based on my own logic, based on the runtime field and formula, which I used. Looks pretty good. I'm gonna save that and return to my dashboard and I have my first panel. So I know that there are long transaction. It was like that almost similar previous day. And um, let's try to identify what caused them. So I'm gonna look at the services and see maybe this long transaction is caused by a specific service. So service name, and I'm going to drag that into the middle. And again, Lens immediately returns a preview and it shows me all the services based on their number of, of transactions. So I'm gonna change that to be again, the percentile of my transaction, 80%. And I can see that every time I'm doing something like that, the suggestions below are changing. I can move between how is it over time, pie charts, even the percentages. And in this case, I'm gonna to choose to use a tree map. And let's see more than five transactions. So I'm gonna see seven transactions here. Now, it seems that majority of the transactions delays or duration is caused by the front end. And that means two things. It's either my users are maybe using uh, older devices, or maybe they're in locations where they have low bandwidth that causes this slowness. Um, let's check it out. So I'm done with the service name. So now I wanna see something else, maybe the user devices. So I'm gonna take the user agent name and I'm gonna override it with the service name. And that's what really helps for ad hoc exploration because all whatever I configured here remains the same. So I can just override it and look at it from a different perspective. Now, in this case, I actually wanna see that as a table because then I can compare absolute numbers. And I can see that based on the different, um, different uh, devices, I'm gonna remove all others here. But the second question I have is how is it geographically? So I'm gonna search for geo and I have continent name here. Now in Lens, we also have pivot table. And for those of you who tried ever to do a pivot table on 500,000, documents, you know that most spreadsheets cannot handle those the scale. But in Lens, we're supporting that using Elasticsearch strengths. So I'm just gonna drag the continent name into my columns here and see how fast is it. I can, I'll just reduce this label here, but, and I can see the devices and how is it based on the different locations in the world, which is quite awesome. Now, to help even further, I can also help read the data and the values by coloring them by value. So let's choose a different color palette. I'm gonna choose the temperature here, but here I can distinguish very easily and compare between the values quite fast using the colors and the pivot table. So I'm gonna save that. Awesome, so I've seen that there is some, some distinguish between the places they are in the world. Let's look at it again from a geographical standpoint and see Maybe I can point to a specific place. Now I have a field here, which are coordinate. It's a coordinate field and I'm going to click on it. And what it does is that it suggests me to visualize it in maps. In Kibana, we have a dedicated geospatial maps application, which is super strong for visualizing all geospatial uh, information. So I'm going to click here. And what it does is it takes me from lands, move me to the geo map and to the maps application. And look, it already took the index and it provides me with sort of like the transactions and where they're coming from. And when I'm zooming in, it will show me more and more information, which is awesome. The other thing that we've done is we pre-configured all kinds of uh, layers on the map based on common scenarios. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna click here and I'm gonna move to the observability layers. 
And I have here APM, real user monitoring performance. I'm gonna select that and see what happens. Immediately it configures a map and shows me the world countries based on their performance. So the more reddish it is, it means that the performance is, is longer. For example, here in Belarus, it's longer than it is in France. This is super nice in order to understand sort of like where are the bottlenecks and whether I actually have areas in the world that their slowness just caused by low bandwidth. And I'm gonna save that to my dashboard. We also introduced this new path. So you can just select your dashboard and I'm gonna call it geo and save that into the dashboard. And immediately is another panel in my dashboard that I can look at. Awesome. So going back to my presentation here, I managed to answer a lot of those questions and the analysis I'm doing is very common, to be honest. I'm trying to narrow down and to get to what caused the problem. Is it the location? Is it the device? Is it the specific service? In Elastic, we also have machine learning models, which can really help and automate that type of analysis. In Elastic, the machine learning is unique because it wasn't made only for data scientists to use. So any user can use it. And we focus our machine learning on two areas. One is the anomaly detection in time series data. And we create a model and the model learns about the properties of the data, daily, weekly, periodically, trends, drops and spikes and more. And then it can identify when the data is unusual or anomalous in an unsupervised way. The second area is data frame analysis that lets you build your own models using pre-built built-in regression, classification, and outlier detection. Now, for those of you who already have models outside of Elastic, that's great because we now support third parties. You, are all, you can train your models using third parties and then import the trained models into Elasticsearch. So I'm gonna take it back to my demo and I'm gonna leverage machine learning here. So I'm still in my dashboard, but I'm gonna add a machine learning that I configured and I'm gonna, use the anomaly chart. And I have a job here that says APM, high mean transaction duration. That's great, I'm gonna take that. And it just added that into my dashboard like it's any other of my custom visualizations. And when I look at it, I can see that there is some anomalous activity here. So let's focus on that. I'm gonna focus on the advert service. And again, the data, the dashboard in Kibana are super interactive. So all of my panels were just refreshed and focusing now on the specific service. And, and what I can see is a few things. When I'm looking at the chart that I built, I can see that when I'm focusing on this service, most of the transactions are long transaction. I have 97 percentile of the ratio of long transactions. And if I look closely, I can also see that sort of like the transaction duration have spikes in the similar places to where the machine learning found spikes. And here it reports an anomalous activity with anomaly score of 92. Let's, let me dive deeper to understand what caused it. What's nice about the machine learning models is that it shows me that there is an anomaly, normalize it, but it also shows you what influenced that anomaly. So when I'm looking here on the bottom, I can see that this is an anomaly because it's three times higher. Usually it's 400 milliseconds, but right now it's 1.3 seconds. And it's influenced by two services. One is the advert service and the other one is the request type, which is phenomenal because it shows me two areas that also contributed highly to the transaction duration time. What I showed you right now is, is the ability to do custom machine learning models and visualizations. If you're using one of our solutions, you're already getting it baked in because when you're using observability, security and enterprise search, we know what kind of questions you might have when looking at your data, and we pre-built machine learning models inside those solutions. So let's take the example of APM. When I'm in APM, I have service map. This is a topology that's created automatically. And what you can see here is that advert service specifically is red, and I'm gonna click on it, and I can see that it's red because the anomaly score is 92. Um, this is one of the ways that we're embedding machine learning models out of the box inside our solution with the right context. And you can leverage that to find problems and, and what caused those problems fast. Going back to my slides, um, it's not gonna be a keynote without some future announcements. So for many years, many of you asked us, how can we correlate between two data sources, two indices together? And I'm happy to announce that we're starting to work on something very excited in Elastic. 
we're starting to work on joints. Those will be query time joints between multiple indices. But this is sort of like the first announcement that it's actually happening. And I'm going to let Steve expand on that. Thanks, Alona. It's really amazing to see how far we've come and making it easy to explore and understand your data. And I love that we're providing these great experiences for DevOps folks, security analysts, and more through the dedicated solution UIs inside Kibana, but that ability to peel back the covers and dive right into the data is very powerful. And joins, whew, that's a big one. Um, the idea of having joins in Elasticsearch goes back many years. And over the years, we've introduced some limited ways to do join-like things. Features like parent-child, now called join fields, they let you express simple relationships and query against them with a specialized syntax. Uh, and things like the terms lookup filter provides a very narrow way to go and expand your query. Uh, but historically, we've been resistant to go further. However, with the progress we have made with things like the asynchronous query execution framework in Elasticsearch and full support for that through Kibana, and these growing sets of use cases we have for the stack, we're coming back around and thinking differently about it. Um, so this is an exciting area for us to take on, but it is still very early days. And so we're asking for your input. Hop into the conference AMA and share your use cases for joins, or go plus one an issue in GitHub that represents your needs. Uh, there will be a lot more to come in this area over the next few months, and your input will be critical around it. So far, we've highlighted a lot of new features and capabilities, uh, but one of the biggest areas we focus on isn't really a feature per se, it's the total cost of ownership. How can we make things faster, smaller, and more efficient so that your hardware and your dollars go further? Um, for that, I'd like to hand it over to Quinn Hoxie, tech lead for Elasticsearch, to dive into a few of the big improvements that are underway here. Hi everyone, my name is Quinn Hoxie and I'm the tech lead for the Elasticsearch team. And I'm here today to talk to you about a lot of the investments we've been making in optimizing the various workloads, uh, be it you know, storage, network, query efficiency in Elasticsearch. Uh, and really with the goal being to help you optimize your investment in the platform. So I want to talk through a few different themes that we've been investing in. Uh, and the first of those is storage efficiency and flexibility. So the first topic is uh, searchable snapshots. And this is something that you know, we've been talking a lot about. It's an extremely exciting set of features. Uh, and the idea is that we wanted to leverage low cost cloud storage um, that is you know, ubiquitous today. And we wanted to allow you to shift as much of your data there as possible. Uh, really the goal being to dramatically reduce the cost of storing more and more data. If you wanna look back further for regulatory reasons, whatever it may be, we wanted to be able to enable that for low cost. Uh, and, and really a guiding principle for us is that we didn't want to change the way you interact with the system. We didn't want you to have to jump through hoops just to lower this cost. And so what we did was we created a system where your experience is the same. It's entirely seamless. If you're looking at a dashboard in Kibana and it happens to be backed by data in the hot tier uh, on local drives or data that is in a searchable snapshot, your experience is the same. Even if we have to go fetch that data, it's all working the same for you. The experience is the same and that's key. Searchable snapshots, really what we're doing is that we are shifting that data to the cloud storage, uh, but we're keeping around just enough to be very precise about what data we need to fetch. Obviously, there's, there's time and cost involved in going and actually pulling that data down uh, to perform the search. And so what we do is we keep around just enough metadata to make that efficient. And so when we're pulling data down, we pull down the smallest amount possible. We know exactly what files to retrieve, the portions of the shards to, to fetch to actually perform the search locally. And all the data is cached really intelligently too. So if you go and you load a dashboard or touch the similar data based on queries or explorations that you're doing, you're not gonna incur that same cost every single time. We're very smart about what we keep local to the cluster, and therefore you get you know, dramatic speed ups if you're looking at similar data as you, as you go through it. Next up in storage efficiency is uh, something that we saw in our tests about a 10% storage reduction for, uh, and it has to do with how we compress stored fields. So when we're storing the data in Elasticsearch, whatever data you're shipping into the cluster, um, we obviously have the raw form of that data and we compress it. Um, we've compressed it for a long time, but what we wanted to do is look at how can we make that compression more efficient. And we use some best practices from the industry. And a key part of that was having a shared dictionary. So when we separate the data into these blocks, uh, we also want to have a shared dictionary, which helps achieve more efficient compression. And like I said, in our tests, 
that got us about a 10% reduction in storage, which at scale, that ends up being pretty dramatic. Another 10% storage reduction we saw in our test was with a, a new type uh, that we're introducing uh, called match-only text. And what we were doing is that we looked at some of our most common cases like log analysis. And a lot of the, a lot of the queries that are needed for log analysis don't actually end up using a lot of the, the different data that we're storing under the hood for different fields. Um, when, you, when you have this data stored, we try to enable a, a very wide breadth of queries um, at the Lucene level. And the reality is that for something like log analysis, most of that ends up going unused. So what we try to do is create a field type that was dedicated to the most common types of log analysis that we see, uh, and you know, really take take a look at what we can make as a minimal trade off to get some really significant storage reduction. And the way we did that was by removing a few key things, and that's length normalization factors, term frequencies, and positions. And so there, of course, there are trade offs. Um, you know, we do disable relevance storing and span queries. Um, you do have a little bit of a performance hit on phrase queries, but ultimately for the, the types of operations that people end up doing uh, in, in log analysis workloads, this really isn't impactful and getting that 10% storage reduction is, is a great trade-off to make. Next up, we have storage efficiency and flexibility for dedicated metric support. Now, this is an exciting one. Uh, we've touched on it a bit before, but the team has really been diving into how can we get better at metrics? And we've you know, made a lot of investments over the years. Storing, storing metrics in Elasticsearch has long been a use case that we focus on. Uh, and we've done a lot of things to optimize it over the years. But what we wanted to do is take a really fresh look at it and see how far we can actually take this. And so the team has seen some really early results that are quite impressive. Um, we're seeing dramatic reductions in storage size, upwards of 50% reduction uh, for, for metrics data. And what's exciting about this is that by taking a fresh look at it, we can also explore new ways of actually querying that data. Um, you know, the most common way out there to query metrics data is probably PromQL. And by reassessing how we store the data and making it more efficient for not just on a storage level, but for queries um, and introducing something like PromQL, very excited about the future and what it holds for using Elasticsearch as a, as a dedicated metric store. Next up is search and aggregation performance. Now, this is something that the team just makes continuous investments in. And I'm really excited to share, you know, when we look back at the last year, the, uh, the amount of performance improvements that we've made to queries and aggregations is, is just staggering. Uh, if, if you look back uh, at 710, which is about a year ago, um, you see things like date histogram improvements where we made things 50% faster. A number of these are both you know, speed and memory reduction improvements. So when you add all this up over the last year, uh, you really see some of our most common workloads on clusters getting you know, dramatically more performant, um, you know, leading to better cluster resilience because of the memory reductions for these common operations. Uh, but I wanted to highlight uh, a few pieces of work that we've done in the last, last few releases that that I think are really exciting and kind of follow a common thread. So we looked at the date histogram aggregation and, uh, and that is one of our most common aggregations. And we reassessed some optimizations that we had looked at years ago. And essentially what we thought was, how could we potentially leverage the search index to make these aggregations faster? Now, certain operations like filtering on, a, on the search index are, are much faster than what happens in, in aggregations. And so by shifting some of this workload to the search index, we can make things a lot faster. But do, doing that shift uh, was, was the tricky part and, and how could we do it? Um, and a lot of it came down to how we, how we create the date histogram under the hood. It has to do with uh, rounding of the dates as they get into the system and our ability to then translate the date histogram into a range aggregation, which we can translate into a filter aggregation. And that filter aggregation is where we can see about an 8x speed up uh, by translating it into what you know, we've been calling a filter by filter uh, approach. And, and ultimately this doesn't apply to every single case of a date histogram, uh, but we essentially create a plan, which is a series of decisions that the system makes when, when the aggregation query comes in uh, to decide you know, which optimizations can be applied to it. 
So once we did that for date histogram, the team did an excellent job of kind of figuring out how to actually make that speed up achievable. Uh, we also went forward and ended up applying it to other aggregations like terms in a similar way. So very exciting things, again, just chipping away at, at various performance improvements we can make uh, for you in the snack. Next up, we have uh, efficient and resilient clusters, and, and oftentimes those things go together. Um, so we decided to package up some, some recent wins we've made in this area that I'm, I'm very excited about. So we have uh, a, lot of, a lot of chatter between nodes in, in a cluster, and uh, for, for a long time, we've had the ability to compress that traffic over the network um, that is happening between nodes. But there, there were some there were some drawbacks that we experienced in the wild or in benchmarks. Um, one is that we felt like we could get the compression to be more efficient. You know, all compression is going to be a trade-off in you know how like how much time you spend compressing and then the actual ratio that you get out of that. And one of the things we introduced recently was the ability to switch to LZ4 compression. Uh, it's a widely accepted industry standard uh, and really targets efficiency. And for something like compression over the network, that is going to be key. And we've looked at, we've done really extensive testing of this and just seen extremely promising results um, by, by switching on LZ4 compression. The other thing that we did here is that we looked at what was actually being compressed between nodes. And uh, prior to this, it was, it was everything. When you turned on compression, you were turning on compression for everything that was going between nodes uh, in your Elasticsearch cluster. And while a lot of the workloads benefit from compression, not all of them do. In fact, some of the data is, is already compressed that's being moved around. And so what we want to do is take a fresh look at that and say, you know, we're introducing this LD4, this more, more optimal compression. Um, maybe we can be more surgical about what we actually compress that's going over the wire. And so we looked at, you know, what are the different workloads and the types of data that are being transferred between nodes and which ones could we look at as being the highest value things or the highest leverage things for us to actually compress. And when we did that, we ended up introducing uh, a new approach to, to the transport compression that we're calling indexing data. And what we've done is we've gone through those different workloads, the different types of data that we ship over the wire, looked at the ones we estimate will be most compressible and allowed you to say, I just want the most compressible things to be, to, to be uh, you know, subject to LZ4. And uh, what we've seen in our tests is, is really phenomenal, um, especially when you look at this in a cloud environment where you may be subject to data transfer costs. This can have a really dramatic impact on, uh, on the types of costs that you incur from that network traffic. So this is something we're very excited to, to introduce. I think that introducing LZ4 and the indexing data like more surgical compression is going to be a, a huge boost for, uh, for our customers. Next up for efficient resilient clusters, we have a double win, which are our favorite types of our favorite types of changes. Uh, and this is the ability to do recovery from snapshots. When you take snapshots, they're stored in uh, in something like a cloud cloud object store, and uh, and you know that is for things like backup purposes, and you can restore a snapshot to the cluster. Uh, but we were looking at things like recovery, which uh, is you know a very common operation in clusters. It happens for a variety of reasons. Um, we're looking at that and saying, you know, we have we have these snapshots that have current data, especially if you're looking at, say, an append-only use case, those snapshots have current data. And it, could we use those for recovery? And that does a number of different things for us. Uh, it will optimize a lot of the costs, like we were just talking about, the data transfer costs that you can incur depending on where those peer nodes are living uh, in the system. That could incur data transfer costs, but there are no transfer costs when you're pulling data down from uh, these object stores in public clouds. And so we looked at that, we did some evaluation to say, hey, could we leverage the snapshots that are already there? And these are the snapshots, again, that are backups. These are the snapshots that can be leveraged for searchable snapshots. So really, this is just taking all the work the team's done to make that as robust as possible and leveraging it in new ways. And so what we have now is the ability to actually do uh, shard recovery from snapshots. Uh, and this has kind of a compounding effect. One, you get some incredible speed in terms of how we pull down the, the shards from that snapshot. Uh, but we also are lightening the load on the rest of the cluster. 
uh, if you're doing a recovery, you might be in a state where your cluster is operating with low headroom. Maybe there's some instability happening uh, based on based on that capacity. But in normal circumstances, the peer recovery would happen by talking to other nodes and pulling the data from them, which of course puts extra load on the cluster in those scenarios. By pulling that data down from the cloud object store, you're alleviating that extra pressure on the cluster, and that's going to lead to greater stability in circumstances where you're doing this recovery. So very, very excited about the multiple you know, benefits that we get from this work. Next up, we have the ability to, uh, to actually do more methodical replacement of nodes in clusters. So when you're making a topology changes in a cluster, um, obviously there's a variety of reasons. Maybe you're actually changing the overall topology. Maybe you're, maybe you're just replacing a node. Maybe you're taking a node out of commission for a period of time. Uh, but in a lot of cases, you know what your ultimate state of the cluster is going to be. Uh, but because Elasticsearch cares a lot about you know, availability and the redundancy of your data, when you pull a node out of the cluster, even if you have the ability to know where, like what's going to happen after that if you're replacing it with a node, uh, Elasticsearch is going to do a lot of work under the hood to do things like rebalance and ensure that you're not going to lose data, things are still going to be available. Uh, but in certain cases, we want you to have the ability to kind of telegraph what those changes are going to be and make what the cluster does a lot more predictable. So to that end, we're introducing some APIs to allow you to be more explicit with what those cluster changes are going to be, whether you're shutting down a node, whether you're replacing a node, it'll allow the cluster to make better decisions about what it does during that transitional phase. And last up for efficient, resilient clusters, uh, you know, as, as, as we get more and more workloads, uh, you know, we have an increasing number of indexes in the average cluster. Uh, and really, we want to just you know, be better at scaling up to more and more indices on clusters. You know, there's a limit to the number of shards that that we recommend storing on an individual node, and that's generally why people tend to to scale out clusters. Um, but that's something that we're always evaluating, and the team is taking a hard look right now at you know what are some of the challenges that we run into as a node gets too many shards on it, uh, and how might we be able to alleviate some of that uh, with with some work the team's evaluating. So. More to come on that, but something that we're very excited about investing in. All right, and with that, I'm going to pass it back to Steve. Thanks, Quinn. The range of improvements here is pretty amazing. You know, one aspect that stood out to me was that so many of these improvements are informed or motivated by the needs of logging or metrics, traces, or, or security data. Uh, and it goes back to what we mentioned at the beginning. For all of our use cases, we have one data store, Elasticsearch, and one UI, it's Kibana. Uh, and we're constantly looking for ways to expand what these products are capable of and improve the efficiency of those for common use cases. And it's great because if you look at something like the dedicated metric support, of course that helps with infrastructure metrics. That's what we built it for. That's what we're targeting. Um, but if you think of all the other use cases for time series metrics from NetFlow data to IoT, this greater efficiency and performance, it expands what's possible and what's practical to do in given time and budget. So this concept of having a single platform that everything's built around, that's what lets us focus on these core capabilities, streamlined onboarding, more powerful and user-friendly analytics, and more efficient use of your hardware and budget. So far today, we've only been able to scratch the surface of what our teams are working on. If we look back over the last year, the number of features and improvements, it's overwhelming. Uh, just look at our 715 release. It's a minor release with major new capabilities, again. Uh, it's humbling to work with such a great team of over 800 engineers who wake up every day and solve incredibly hard problems to move these products forward. And the reason we do all this, it's you. Uh, I've been working at Elastic for the last seven years, and the reason I still wake up so excited to come to work is that I know what a big impact we're making for millions of people and businesses around the world. We see it in our download stats. We see it in your attendance here today and how more folks than ever are finding success in Elastic Cloud. And we're also seeing great validation across the board. Even analysts like Gartner, Forrester, and others are recognizing the stream of constant innovation here uh, and how quickly our products have matured. With that, let's get to the rest of this conference. Thank you for being a part of our community. Thank you for spending time with us and sharing your successes and your challenges. We're honored to be here with you. Um, we have a tremendous number of sessions today from our engineering teams, from our customers who are out there solving some of the world's biggest challenges. So please go forth, uh, enjoy the day, and then go out and solve.